but uh, the hand is always protected. You need a fast, light and sharp implement which is solid in the hand. And you don't need a wide cross guard because there's nothing to be expected coming down here. There may be occasional, there may be occasional um, situations where you actually do have contact, but then this is enough. And the same is true for organic fittings, particularly this Roman styles with the half bolts. Yeah? They perfectly safeguard your hand if there is a bind. Not if somebody strikes to your hand, fingers are gone and the organic fitting will not help you. But if there's an occasional bind and just slides down, see here, here he would hit me. If that was a wooden bowl, he would get stuck in the wooden bowl. So the Gladius and the Sparta, the earlier forms, are actually very clever if you don't fight with blade binds but with shield binds. Now, um, just to explain the difference, I will finally show you some of the shield <coughs> fighting that is actually to be reconstructed because we have actual sources for it. Now that is fought with uh, so-called bucklers. It's pretty apparent that uh, because of the difference in size, you would fight differently, right? Now, um, if I try to do, if I try to do the same techniques, this is probably not going to work. <laughs> Before I even get there, I'm dead. Which again is the reason why the round shield is that long, because you need that reach. Yeah, there is no no sensible middle size. Now. Um, Around the year 1000, maybe pretty uh, 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 slightly earlier, swords with wider cross guards come up. Yeah, with wide cross guards, the typical type uh, 10 to 12 swords. And uh, I think they came up because horsemanship became more important, and because um, fighting and disciplined order became more important. Because this is a really cool weapon for single combat. And it's uh, not that cool if you're in a formation. Actually, I think that that's my personal theory, that the overlapping shield wall is just uh, making up for the weaknesses of that shield. <clears throat> it's still a weapon that is perfect for single combat. And if you look at Viking culture, or at least what we know about it, or about uh, at Germanic culture, they are obsessed with single combat. If you look, if, I, if I'd go into a skirmish uh, in one of the Icelandic sagas, that's a perfect shield. I will not go into the details what differs here uh, in comparison to the dome shields that we have as well. Yeah? Oh, by the way, um, some of the Germanic, some of the Germanic uh, round shields may have been slightly domed, slightly convex. It still works to a certain degree, as soon as the bend becomes too extreme, these techniques don't work anymore. Why? Because here, the, arm, the shield is an extension of the arm. If the, uh, if the shield was curved extremely, I couldn't give any pressure anymore. That's a, uh, that's a different topic, it's just a side note. If anybody wants to ask any question about convex shields or maybe uh, curved kite shields and stuff like that, just approach me later, I'm happy to answer any question. But now to the, to the buckler. Now the buckler is a weapon that is not designed for the battlefield. You see it, um, not primarily, you see it uh, as a sight uh, weapon for archers, for instance. But it's not you're not supposed to run into the front line with sword and buckler. It's not a good idea. If there are skirmishes or battle lines break up or you... Uh, you plunder a city, and it's good to have this. Yeah, it's kind of like the what the cult uh, single action, what the what the cult was in, in the peacemaker in the late uh, 800s, sword and buckler in the Middle Ages. <clears throat> now, as I said, some of the concepts we had here don't apply to sword and buckler anymore. Why is that? Because of reach. So now the sword has to take over tasks that the um, shield was taking over earlier. So the main attack that somebody would deliver would be a strike from the right shoulder. That's what you do if you want to hit somebody, you have no idea how to use a weapon or a club, you hit like this, right? This is in fact one of the most common strikes in, 
historical swordsmanship too. So I'm going to show you how the 133 manuscript, that's a very advanced and sophisticated uh, manuscript describing fighting with sword and buckler, deals with that situation. So um, let's just assume the both of us enter a fight, we're standing in our guard, and now um, uh, let's assume he's an extremely um, competent swordsman, he steps forward and hits my head. <coughs> Okay, it's pretty hard to do with a shield being there. <clears throat> now, if I was too weak because I'm worn out, he, might, he may strike through. Yeah, maybe, maybe, he caught, maybe he caught the flat if my shield turns, he still hits my head. So this is a typical attack that is to be expected. Also, he may just simply step offline and strike at me and I'm a slow slug. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the concept of uh, this manual is that as soon as you see somebody in a certain specific ward, these are the basic stances that you start your fighting from. Um, this is, for instance, called second ward. I know what he's up to. Why would I know what he's up to? What could he do against me? Except striking to, striking to the head. Is there anything else he could do? Well, just it doesn't matter if you say Why something stupid. It? Yeah, he could, he could cut down, <clears throat> cut, cut in my leg. Oh, magic. <laughs> I hit his head and he misses my leg. Oh, I must, have ha I must have the longer sword, right? Nope. Doesn't look like it. I must have long longer arms. Uh, strange, isn't it? <laughs> Again, now without shields, just... So two gentlemen wanting to hit each other. One gentleman's going for the leg. The other's going for the head. <laughs> now this is biomechanics again, and it's a principle that we find in the treatises again. It's called Überlaufen, and it works like so. Your arm, your sword is attached to your arm, your arm is attached to your shoulder. As you lower, you do the same, just lift. As you lower your arm, you lose reach. Okay? Because the arm is not on, uh, on a construction that goes... <laughs> <laughs> if, your, if your arm was attached to your ass, he would have won. Right? So that's not the case. So uh, this is another of these universal laws which shows us you can reconstruct sword fighting because, of course, they knew it, and it's in the treatises too. So um, back to the situation. He cannot strike at my leg without being hit himself. So I know... The most, like he could, he could actually uh, change position. He could actually go to a different position, like so, for instance, in order to strike from that shoulder. Yeah. But that, as he does that, as he does that, I can attack. He wastes tempo. Okay. Again, fencing theory. So if he's if, he, if he's clever, he has to take the most direct route. Just do it slowly. The most direct route for the sword is to travel on a straight line into the target. So when I see this position as I come to a fight, I can look into the future assuming he's a competent swordsman. If he's not a competent swordsman, he's going to die anyway. <laughs> if he is a comp competent swordsman, I just simply close this line. And now uh, this, is only, this is going to be only one of two examples I'm going to give, but keeping the bind is eminent for all swordsmanship. You don't want to leave now. Because this bind tells me what, he's, uh, what he will be doing next. But I'm closer to him now, so looking into the future through the bind will kill him. If there's little pressure here, I just simply go forward, block his weapons and cut through his face. If there, let's go to the field, you go to second, I go to Schützen and we go to the bind, right? Oh, ward. I go here, yeah? If there's a lot of pressure, oh, I feel it through the bind, yeah? It's leverage. I go here, I go where the pressure takes me. And if there's kind of equal pressure, I step through. His sword can go nowhere, there's his, his shield, my blade, my cross guard, my buckler, and I cut forward, which opens his neck. While I cut forward, I twist my hand either this way or that way that opens the wound and leaves a gashing wound and that'll bleed him out if he doesn't die instantly. Okay, um, 
And the, the last thing I'm going to show is an extremely strange ward that you see in buckler fighting. And it's this one, which looks kind of stupid. Yeah. Why would I want to do anything like that? Yeah. Um, this is a ward which is designed to attack the weapon side. So if I'm standing like this, if we come to the field to kill each other, and I go to second to strike at him, and he's in this ward and he's faster than I am, then he can just simply attack my weapon side, the unguarded side. I just showed you how easy it is to ward off any blows to the head with a buckler. Do so, please. Just ward the blows off. See, to attack his head here is extremely difficult, even if I hit hard. And the same applies to my side, so if you just attack me here. <laughs> but I can easily attack his weapon side. And this is actually the same as we just saw with, uh, with a big round shield. Yeah? He can't attack up there. I can't attack up there where his shield would be. So I just go around. So um, this is just to show some of the concepts and principles you can analyze in the older treaties and use them to um, try to make an educated guess how you would have used weapons that we don't have any written sources about. Thank you.